And we are back. Welcome to Untested Arcana, Episode 5. This is the show where I take popular media and characters and turn them into tabletop RPG content. At this point, that just means 5th edition subclasses, but in the future, it could be all sorts of things. Last week, I took a sort of accidental week off because I got sick, but also noticed an interesting trend. Uh, I've posted four videos so far. Made a Lucario video, it got 26 views. I made a Robin from Fire Emblem video, got 112 views. Then I made a Maple from Bofrey video, and it's got 1,500 views. And then I made a Hulk video, and it has uh, 15 views. So until I know why, uh, I think I'm just going to lean into this, and we're going to do some anime nonsense, because I think people want uh, anime nonsense. So on that note, I thought it would be a good time to look at a character and a character archetype that I think is kind of tricky to make in 5th edition right now, and that's the stretchy guy. And anime's premier stretchy guy, without question, is Monkey D. Luffy, which presents an interesting set of powers to try to make a subclass from. I mean, you've got the basics. He's strong, he's fast, he's tough, he punches, he's shirtless, and he's stretchy. Most of those are well-established abilities somewhere in the 5e library. Then you get to the kind of weirder stuff. He can use all three forms of hockey. He can use armament, which hardens his skin. He can use observation, which lets him anticipate danger. And then he can use conqueror, which lets him knock people out by, like, looking at them. Oh, he's also resistant to lightning, which only really comes up once, but it is worth mentioning. On top of all of that, he's got a bunch of, like, forms, uh, form changes that boost all of his baseline powers, his strength, his speed, his punching. And all of those have, like, distinct properties, but we're not going to get into that. And then lastly, and this is a spoiler for anyone who isn't caught up, apparently he's, he's not just a rubber man. He's the avatar of, like, a god of freedom. So his powers are really restricted to what he can imagine, and it's about freedom and flexibility, not explicitly rubber. And also, now that he's aware of this, he can do a thing where he makes the world around him rubber, not just himself. That gets a little weird. So looking at this list, the good news is that we can knock out like half of this by just making the right class choice for this subclass. And I think the right choice is Barbarian. That'll knock out strong, tough, shirtless, fast, they get fast movement as a feature. The hardening themselves against damage, that's just a rage feature. Dissipating danger, that's danger sense. And the form changes. Rage is a form change. Which means that all we have to do is make the punching, the stretching, the lightning resistance, the knocking people out with a glare, and also becoming a god who can make the world around them rubber. So, you know, easy. I want to take a second to talk about something. This is something that's going to come up if you are doing this if you're making homebrew. Um, A lot of people in media punch. Punching is very, very common. And what sucks is you don't want to make everyone either a monk or a fighter with the unarmed fighting style. And so you kind of have to make a decision when you set out to do this. Am I going to make a subclass that builds in unarmed strikes? Uh, Look at something like Beast Barbarian. On the other hand, you could just write it in such a way that if a character chooses the fighting style feat and gets unarmed fighting, that it'll just meld well with what you made. I look at, like, Path of the Zealot with Divine Fury. That adds damage to a weapon attack, but weirdly with the rules, an unarmed strike is a weapon attack, it's just not an attack made with a weapon. So you could play a Zealot Barbarian with the unarmed fighting style who punches and deals necrotic damage. So those are your choices. Either you put unarmed fighting into the subclass, or you just write it in such a way that they can apply their features to unarmed strike and allow the player to gain unarmed fighting some other way. I think that since the theme of this subclass is going to be sort of, let's be honest, like body horror, which is what stretchy powers really are, I think we're within our rights to put unarmed fighting in the subclass. So with that big choice aside, um, we also need to just talk about theme in general. I've said this in other videos, you don't want to make something that is so restrictive thematically that it's like you could only make Luffy with this. You want to make something that's more broadly applicable and maybe has a wider theme. And so I kind of poked around in D&D Beyond and I remembered that there is a monster in 5th edition that is stretchy, 
that has lightning resistance and, most importantly, has an established connection to a god of the D&D multiverse. And that's the black pudding. And so I realized, like, this is it. Like, you're not the rubber man. You're a black pudding barbarian. You're stretchy like a black pudding. You resist lightning like a black pudding. And maybe you have a connection to a horrible eldritch deity who gives you special powers. Like a black pudding. Oh, even better, black pudding is OGL legal. It's in the basic rules. I can reference it. Now, the god it's connected to, which I believe is pronounced Jewablex, is not OGL legal. So we're not going to name drop it, but we are going to kind of imply it. But this made me realize in a weird way that Luffy's power set is not totally dissimilar from like a Venom, a symbiote character. So, you know, great news. We're getting a freebie today. This is, on the surface, a Luffy subclass, but it straight up could just be Venom. You could just use it exactly as is, and you've got Venom. And the only real difference is when Luffy transforms, only his fists turn black. That's the difference. So that's it. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Path of the Black Pudding. For most barbarians, a black pudding is an inconvenience on their way to the real fight. But for some warriors, its flexibility and tenacity are to be admired. A few, followers of the Path of the Black Pudding, have gone so far as to infuse their own bodies with its power, granting them bizarre and sometimes unsightly abilities. Many who follow the Path come to feel that the pudding has connected them to a deeper, darker, perhaps even godlike force. Many would argue with this belief, though most would lose that fight to a barrage of pitch-dark fists. So that's the flavor. It kind of leans a little more Venom in a lot of ways. But I think you could totally imagine a character like Luffy, who perhaps ingested a piece of black pudding by accident, or ingested something that was intended to be used by one of these barbarians ritualistically, but he just, like, ate it as a child and didn't think anything of it, which is, you know, essentially Luffy's backstory anyway. So again, you're not restricted to, like, oh, I've given myself over to the power of the Dark God. No, you could have done this totally by accident, or you could be born like this. That's totally up to you. Barbarians, generally speaking, get two features at third level, uh, just to kick them off, and it usually defines how the archetype plays. So our two features for this are Unstable Form and Gelatinous Rage. Unstable Form reads, Starting when you choose this path at third level, your body is blessed by the gelatinous gift of the Black Pudding. Your unarmed strikes can deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier on a hit. In addition, when you make a melee attack on your turn, your reach is 5 feet greater than normal as your limbs stretch and warp. This reach increases to 10 feet at 10th level and 15 feet at 15th level. I made the unarmed strikes pretty low level. I made them essentially like tavern brawler unarmed strikes. You'll see in a second that this gets adjusted. But again, if somebody wanted to take the unarmed fighting style, I'm leaving room for them to gain something. The stretching thing, that was tough to try and figure out kind of the level gates for it, but there are a couple of barbarian subclasses that have like damage increases at various levels and they happen all over the place. I have seen things that increase at 10 and I've seen things that increase at 15. So I just kind of chose those because I thought those were nice levels. I know that Luffy in the show can stretch like hundreds of feet sometimes, but I feel like that's very cinematic and not, not necessary at the table. A 15-foot additional reach, which is a 20-foot reach on your unarmed strikes, is a lot. That is a battlefield. I feel like that will get you the fantasy of being able to attack anyone from any distance, because who's more than 20 feet away from you that you want to punch? What this doesn't do is, like, mechanize the idea of you being stretchy in everyday life. Like, hypothetically, should you be able to stretch across a small canyon and let your party walk across your back? Yeah, I'm not really going to mechanize that. I think that a good DM would read this and be like, well, you can make an unarmed strike that reaches out like that. So you make a grapple check against that tree that's 20 feet away. Just be cool, DMs. And if your DM isn't cool, like, well, then they're not going to let you play a homebrew subclass anyway, are they? The second feature is Gelatinous Rage. Also at third level, your rage manifests as a shimmering shell of black ooze. When you enter a rage, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your barbarian level. While raging, the damage of your unarmed strikes increases to 1d8, and you can choose to either deal acid or bludgeoning damage on a hit. You also gain resistance to acid and lightning damage. So this is the first transformation, and we see Luffy get that like black covering. That is often how armament hockey is illustrated. 
And so all this does is just kind of formalize that, gives you some temporary hit points. I felt like that was appropriate for kind of having the ooze surface, is it just like gives you a little bit of extra protection, especially considering that you have, you know, resistance to all these damage types. I bump up your unarmed strikes because they're now covered in ooze. That makes sense. That's the secondary use of armament hockey anyway. And then gave you acid and lightning resistance because black pudding has acid and lightning resistance. So now we need a sixth level feature. Um, barbarian subclasses don't follow a ton of patterns. It's not like other classes where you can make determinations on what should go at each level based on the other ones. But in general, there are a decent amount of defensive features at sixth level. I also wanted to copy something that you frequently see in other classes and subclasses that happens around fifth or sixth level, which is magical strikes. Moon druids get it. Monks get it. So we're going to kind of combine a couple of things in a way that I think makes thematic sense into the sixth level feature, Rebounder. By sixth level, the powers within you grow restless. While raging, your unarmed strikes are considered magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. And you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage even from magical sources. You can also make one unarmed strike as a bonus action directly after taking the attack action on your turn. So this feature doesn't do a ton. It's In a lot of ways, it's mostly for flavor. We're just cementing the idea that your shimmering ooze, which could be hockey, which could be symbiote, is magical. It protects you from magic. It puts out magical damage. The extra unarmed strike is just to try to push forward this idea that you see in a lot of anime, especially Luffy, of just a barrage of fists. You make two attacks with your action and a bonus action on armed strike. It's just to keep up the pressure. I think getting a damage boost is fine. Most other barbarians are going to get that in some other way. Then at 10th level, we're going to get to one of the weird ones, and it's called Dark Conqueror. At 10th level, your slimy deity makes its presence known to your opponents. As an action, you can choose a number of creatures up to your proficiency bonus that you can see within 30 feet of you. If the target can see or hear you, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw, DC equal to 8 plus your constitution modifier plus proficiency bonus, or be frightened by you until the end of your next turn. A frightened creature's speed drops to zero, and the creature is incapacitated and visibly dazed. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and regain all uses when you complete a short rest. Th this is a big one. Weirdly, I've stolen this from Wizard. This is just the enchantment wizard ability to like stare at someone and daze them. Now that one's a charm. It's only one person. They have to be within five feet. I just tried to mold this to be obviously more powerful, but also just closer to what it's like in the show. I'm not making them fall asleep, but this isn't the sleep spell. I thought about that, but I don't know, it's too complicated to make them become unconscious, but one turn of incapacitated is great because you can use your action to incapacitate them, then maybe use your bonus action to fly into a rage. Then on your next turn, you get three attacks to hit these incapacitated people with, with advantage or whatever. I went back and forth on, on how to limit it. I thought about once per short rest, but I kind of landed on proficiency bonus per long rest because frankly, that gets used across a lot of subclasses, especially newer subclasses. And yeah, this is powerful, but you know, we're making first drafts here. If you get this to the table and this trivializes encounters because you can use it so much and it's so powerful, we'll reduce it. We'll make it once per short rest. We'll make it once per long rest. We'll make it, I don't know, whatever. I think there's some, some things I thought about, like what if you did this as part of the bonus action where you went into a rage and it was limited by how many times you could go into a rage. That's kind of interesting. Again, Untested Arcana, untested subclass. This is what I would bring to the table and find out how it works. The last feature is where we're going to actually dip into the god stuff. And honestly, I didn't think when I started this design that I was even going to get to the god stuff that Luffy does. I just figured that was so unrelated to stretching and punching. But finding the black pudding and finding its connection to Jewablex and finding this theme like really made this all streamlined together. And I'm really excited that I could get to this kind of impossible power in a way that makes sense. And so we end with fluid reality. Starting at 14th level, you can imbue the world around you with an aspect of your godlike flexibility. When you enter a rage, you can choose to summon an aura of pitch black matter extending 15 feet from you in every direction. Surfaces and objects not being worn or carried by other creatures become bouncy and rubbery, making it difficult terrain for creatures other than you. 
While the aura is present, you cannot be charmed, frightened, paralyzed, or stunned, and have blind sight out to a range of 15 feet. The aura lasts for one minute or until your rage ends. You have one use of this feature, which you regain when you complete a long rest. Yeah, I don't know if that's balanced, but I like the idea of you just commanding an area. 15 feet around you, you have blind sight, which is like the ultimate observation hockey. You can't be affected by conditions because, you know, you're the god of freedom and in this case, I've written flexibility. And you just kind of make a weird, bouncy, rubbery world around you, which I just think is fun. The fact that you can only do it once, I kind of went back and forth on. Again, untested. You bring this to the table. If it's just like a fun bonus thing and it's not super powerful, maybe we should give it more uses. But right now, I imagine that it's super powerful because you can't be affected by so many conditions that often take out barbarians. Like, this indirectly gives you immunity to hold person, which is something that I think barbarians who often have very bad soft stats are pretty vulnerable to. But yeah, that's the final feature. You really become the embodiment of this weird, rubbery god. And that's it. Uh, this one's also, like the rest of them, in D&D Beyond right now. If you have any thoughts about this, leave a comment. You know, bummed that I missed a week of this. I was kind of on a roll for... 2023, but I'm back on the horse. I already have plans for the next several episodes. You know, I've never said this, but I guess like, comment, and subscribe if you're interested in this stuff, and I will see you on the next Untested Arcana. See you later.